Hello, Apramada readers. My name is Ratnaguna, and I have with me, I am delighted to have with me, doubly delighted to have with me, Maitreya Bandhu. And Hello, Maitreya Bandhu, and welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Ratnaguna. Really lovely to be on Apramada. That's really great. Thank you. Yeah, wonderful to, to speak with you. Um, our task this afternoon, because it is afternoon when we're recording this, is mm. to talk about and discuss and hear Maitreya Bandhu reading poems from this wonderful volume here. Um, it's uh, Maitreya Bandhu after Cezanne. It's a poem full of, it's a book full of poems about or connected with the artist Cezanne. That's what we're going to do. But before that, I just want to say a few words about Maitreya Bandhu, just in case you don't know who he is. He was ordained into the Tri Ratna Buddhist Order in 1990, which I think is 31 years ago, yes? Yeah, almost 31 days ago today, I think. <laughs> today, is it? Pretty much, yeah, yeah. Oh, you've had two birthdays then in, in yeah. quick succession. Your, your <laughs> Steve's birthday yeah. was on Saturday, wasn't it? <laughs> That's right, yeah. <laughs> and your 31st birthday, which is... Uh, uh, today, oh, yeah, happy yeah. birthday, wonderful. Mm. Uh, so in 2010, Maitreya Bandhu founded Poetry East, which is an arts venue, and they've had many, many guests uh, there. You can see them all being interviewed by Maitreya Bandhu or Nyana Vachra, I think, sometimes mm. on, um, on YouTube. They've had Wendy Cope, Anthony Gormley, Rowan Williams, uh, if you don't know who Rowan Williams is, he used to be the Archbishop of Canterbury. I'm saying that because if you're a Buddhist, you may not know that. I'm mm. sure you do. Uh, Colin Toybin, is that how you pronounce his name? Colin, Colin Toybin, yeah. Toybin, uh, mm. the Irish uh, novelist, I think. Yeah. The um, Charles Eisenstein, who I think is a, a social commentator, isn't he? Yes, that's right, American yeah. social commentator. Yes, and uh, Ian McGilchrist, the extremely intelligent man who wrote the book uh, the master and his emissary That's right. um, and many many more too um, so Maitreya Bandhu is a poet as well as an order member and he's written many poems and he's got many awards for his poetry there's a whole list of them at the beginning of this book I won't list them all to you mm. um, and he's published actually three volumes of poetry I've got them all here um, First one was The Crumb Road in 2013. Lovely little volume. Beautiful picture on the front and the back, isn't it? The, mm. the picture is by um, Sakai Hoitsu, is it? Mm. Yeah, Japanese I think so. painter. Very the beautiful. second one, uh, Yarn, slightly bigger book, 2015. Mm. There we are. Uh, same same, same artist uh, mm. on the front there. And then... Uh, in 2019, so you, you, the first one was 2013, second one 2015, what happened to 2017? <laughs> yes, <laughs> well the Suzanne one took much longer, oh, okay. <laughs> it's going to get it's longer long... and longer, the next one will take forever. It was a longer book, yes, yeah, yeah. so uh, 56 poems in, the, yes. in this volume here, I'll say a bit about that a bit later, um, yes, and the, the, the foreword there's a foreword by Charles Lloyd. Now, um, I'd never heard of Charles Lloyd before, but um, he used to hold a post that I didn't even know existed. Um, where is he now? Find it. Sorry, Christopher Lloyd, not Charles Christopher Lloyd. Christopher Lloyd. Lloyd. Right, yeah. He was the surveyor of the Queen's pictures from 1988 to 2005. Mm. Wow, I'd never heard of that job. <laughs> Um, worked for many years in the Department of Western Art in the Ashlo Ashmolean Museum, Oxford, etc., etc. He's a he's a man with he's done a lot. And the reason I mention him is because uh, the foreword is is really really good, isn't it, my Bandu? Mm. Yeah, it's very very, very good. Very good job. I'm just going to uh, uh, quote a small part of it here. Uh, for many years, he Cezanne was on good terms with the novelist Emile Zola. And if he had not chosen to be a painter, he could have been a poet. Mm -hmm. Now, I find that very interesting because you, Maitre Bandu, used to be a painter. Mm -hmm. You were educated at Goldsmiths College for fine art, mm -hmm. and you switched from being a painter to a poet. So just tell us why you did that. I mean, like, like, like so often, I didn't have a why. I... 
I first got involved with Buddhism when I was 25. I was at second year at art school, at Goldsmiths Art School. And, um, you know, painting was incredibly important to me. And then when I finished art school, coming to the London Buddhist Centre, and I, I ended up being the, care, the caretaker here at the LBC. And um, the thing with painting is you need a studio, really. You need to stretch canvases, you need a studio, you need lots of um, you know, gear. Um, it takes time to set up. And I tried lots of ways of integrating it into my life. I, would, I used to paint in my bedroom upstairs, which meant my, my bedroom was full of oil paint smells. I used to paint sometimes on retreat. I never really found it worked. With painting, it's very obsessional for me. Any creative thing is. And um, anyway, for ages, I struggled with that. You know, I, it seemed that Buddhism and painting wanted all of me. And there was a kind of battle between the two of them for a long time. Then I went away on sabbatical and I started writing. I'd always written poems, but I'd never typed them up. I, I'd, I've read poetry very, well, fairly deeply, particularly since I was ordained. Um, so the idea of writing poetry seemed ridiculous, embarrassing. Um, I'd only read people like Dante and, and Keats and Shelley and Coleridge. You know, I'd not read any modern poetry at all. Uh, so the idea of trying to write a poem always seems just like an embarrassment. Anyway, I typed some of what, what The thing with poetry is you can fiddle with it. You know, like, they're like having a car in the drive. You can get all the bits out and leave them on the drive and go back and fiddle with it, you know. It, with, with a painting, I never felt I could do that, really. Um, what, what's striking to me is that the deeper issues of poetry seem exactly the same as the deeper issues of painting. When I used to paint, I used to say to myself, it wants to be red, and then... I'd find that, no, it doesn't, it wants to be blue, or I'd have a hunch about what I was trying to do in a painting. And writing poetry, I have a hunch about what I'm trying to do in a poem. They're, they're weirdly, the, you know, the, the experience of doing them feels, to me, experientially the same. Um, like, for instance, my best poems tend to be the ones I've worked at hardest. Not always, but nearly always. Um, you always hope to get one for free. Um, you know, you hope to just dash one off and it's perfect and just publish it now. But they, they don't come very often. And I used to have that with painting. You know, you'd, I'd dashed on it off and hope that that was a masterpiece. And they almost never were. Um, the paintings that worked best were the work, ones that I'd got most frustrated with. I remember wanting to throw a painting out of the, uh, my studio window because I got so frustrated with it. Which, interestingly, Cezanne did do. Famously, he, he would, in a rage, fling the painting out of the studio window. And there's a story of one of them falling into an apple tree, and he ha had to get his son to get a stick and poke it out of the tree so he could continue with it. Um, so that, that, that I get the same like, levels of frustration with writing poetry as I do with, uh, with painting. It's just I don't need a studio, I don't need to stretch canvas. I can steal some time from my work, doing, doing goodly things like emails and so on, to correct a word and... The only thing is you tend to then get late nights because then you just think, I'll just correct that word, and then you read it again, and then you change it. And then you, before you know it, you're there for hours. But to me, it feels very much the same engagement, but it's very difficult to tell you, say what that engagement is. It's an engagement with, with the work and what the work wants, not what you want, but what the work wants. Uh, in some strange way, it feels more like you're trying to find out what the poem wants you to write or what the painting wants you to paint, not what, you, what, not what you're trying to do. And that's the bit that's always interested me. But really, it was practical considerations and happenstance, really, that I got to writing poetry. I would, it, was, it still feels a bit embarrassing saying I write poetry. I never call myself a poet. I, you know, that, that's something that should be reserved for people who've been dead for 100 years. Um, you know, I, the, but even the idea of writing poetry, I still feel a bit... I always want to sort of blush when people say, I hear you write poetry. I sort of want to mumble and say, oh, no, you know. If you played a violin, you know, it was really obvious if you were playing it badly. But, you know, poetry is made up of the words that we're using here and now. Um, so anyone thinks they can do it, if you just mean. Anyone nowadays can use a, uh, a keyboard. So it's easy to think that anyone can do it. Just like, but you'd never feel that about, I don't know, um, you know, skydiving, for, you, know, you know, diving into a pool or, you know, or anything else, you know, you, you, there's something about poetry that everyone thinks they can do it. Yes, 
Yeah, just string a few nice words together and they think that's yeah, a poem. Not yeah. the poem. So yeah. funny, I was going to make a joke when I asked you about this question. Was it simply that painting was too messy? And right, yeah. Was, but in a way <laughs> it was. It's only in that. <laughs> <laughs> it was yeah. that yeah. So let, let me just read you uh, a, couple of sec a couple more sections from uh, Christopher Lloyd's foreword. He says, the author of the outstanding sequence of 56 poems published in the present volume, trained as a painter, and is therefore in an ideal position to reflect on all aspects of Cezanne's life and reputation. In addition, the poems show a keen awareness of the broader cultural context in which Cezanne worked at the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries. Mm. Um, and then he says, Cézanne is an important artist because he sought solutions to difficult problems that defeated others. And uh, he gives a quote from um, Cézanne. Cézanne says, nature is always the same, and yet its appearance is always changing. It is our business as artists to convey the thrill of nature's permanence, along with the elements and the appearance of all its changes. Mm. End of mm. quote. So he goes on to say Cézanne struggled with this dilemma almost single-handedly and often felt that he was failing. Yet it is the very fact that he tried and the relentless way in which he drove himself onwards that has won the unceasing admiration of artists and art historians. Mm. Added to this is the human story behind the struggle, the impact on family life and personal relationships, or the toll taken by the self-imposed an unrelenting physical and mental strain. That's a rather long quote, I know, but I'm coming to the, the quote that I really wanted to read to everyone, which doesn't make sense without this first bit. All these aspects of Cézanne's ordeal are fused in Maitre Bando's remarkable poems, in which the varied forms of composition and wide range of reference provide a refreshingly unique insight into Cézanne's art. What is achieved here is an incomparable poetic, poetic expression of the artist's idiosyncrasies and manifold achievements. Mm. <laughs> High praise. Yeah, it's very nice. Very, it's very kind. Yeah. I remember meeting, we met and talked about it. And he, I remember at one point he said, you mentioned Castiglione Grey. Do you, mean, do you mean Raphael's portrait of Castiglione in the Louvre? And I said, I do, yes. He said, well, you have to be very clever to get that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so we could sort of talk about all these references that nobody else would get. Um, yes. Yeah. It was delightful. Wow. wow. So I have a question for you. Um, 56 poems about or connected with Cézanne in this volume. I noticed also in Crumb Road there were at least three poems about or connected with Cézanne. Is that right? Yeah. Only the yeah, three? Yeah, there are, yeah. yeah. That's... 59 poems about Cézanne, which is bordering on the obsessional. Yes. So why, why Cézanne? Why not Rubens, Renoir, Pissarro? Yes. I mean, really, I will have, I, I've sort of had to promise myself and I'm never allowed to write another poem about Cézanne. Um, Cézanne is a great personal hero of mine. Um, you, you end up using sort of those words like, I love Cézanne, you know. Um, um, I don't experience him as an art historical figure or a... I don't, I don't know, uh, an, an important historical figure in painting. You know, Picasso called, said, said he, he was the father, of, the father of us all. But that's not how I see him. I see him, I feel sometimes that I've walked to those great places and, paint, and, and watched Cézanne paint. I mean, it started when I was at art school, uh, so I was 24, and my tutor, my art tutor, who I dearly loved, and I, one of the um, poems is dedicated to her, Alma Thrubrum, she said, you, know, you need to go and look at Cezanne. And I remember going, I think, to look at the one in the Tate. There's not many in London, it's one of the problems. And the, the, the ones we have aren't, you know, they're not bad, but they're not the great selection. But I went to look on one in the Tate, and of course I was 24. What I wanted was de Kooning, you know, painting these really splashy, exciting paintings. I wanted um, Rath, uh, uh, Jasper Johns, I wanted... Robert Rauschenberg with pictures, you know, and Warhol. That's what I was excited by, and that was what I was into at the time. So going to look at this sort of very careful, rather introverted painter of Cezanne's 
painting of Suzanne Gardner, Valier. I remember just being utterly underwhelmed by this painting and not really understanding what, what all the fuss was about. You know, had, people often have that experience in front of a painting. Um, we're so used to screens now that are lit that when you go and look at a painting, they nearly always look very dull and a bit like, oh, they're not as good as they are in reproductionists because you've seen reproductions online, you know. So that was my first encounter. And then not long afterwards, I went to Paris for the opening of the D'Orsay um, Gallery, which that shows you how old I am. I remember going <laughs> to the opening. And uh, I, was, I went with my partner, Gary, and he, he had a press card, which meant that we could be, and the French were very keen on press cards, so we were wafted in um, before all the queues, you know. I was, I, it was like a miracle to me. And uh, I went... Julie, went, you know, I loved my tutor very much. I, I respected her work. You know, she said I should look at Suzanne. I jolly well should, you know. Um, I, I, I knew, I trusted her judgment. So I went and again and had a look at Suzanne because there's the great Suzanne's at the Louvre, not the Louvre, in the Dorsey there. And um, I stood in front of a, a major um, still life of Suzanne. And I had what can only be described as a kind of spiritual experience, except for I don't like the word spiritual. Um, it was also lucky being there with Gary, because Gary, going to a gallery with someone is quite a serious choice, who you go with. You want somebody who will stand there for a long time. I, I used to look at paintings for like an hour at a time, um, an hour and a half at a time. And anyway, I stood in front of this painting and just stood there for ages. And Gary you know, went to the cafe and read magazines, and, but didn't, there was no sense that I had to hurry, which is really important. You, know, you don't want any sense that somebody wants you to do something. Anyway, I was just looking at this painting, and then I seemed to sort of go deeper and deeper into the painting, and I seemed to sort of move outside of time and space, is the only way I can talk about it. Um, the, painting seemed to, um, the painting seemed to be alive. It was, it was like it was a puzzle that kept solving itself and then creating a new problem which it would then solve, and you could sort of go deeper and deeper into the painting kind of mystically kind of moving and solving problems and then creating new problems which it would then solve. Like um, one of those kaleidoscope things, a constantly moving pattern, or something like that, of beauty. And I, I couldn't get to the end of it. I just seemed to see keep almost falling into the kaleidoscopic um, call and response of the, per of the painting. This, this apple was calling to that apple, that colour was being reflected in this colour. Um, there seemed to be, I seemed to, to, to gain a, access to Suzanne's mind um, in some way, and his mind, stretched mind beyond the limits of who I thought I was. I, yeah, so I, I had this kind of transcendent experience, I suppose. And I, it's because human beings can have those that we make such a fuss about the arts in, at all, if you see what I mean. Um, sometimes you really wonder what all the fuss is about, and it's, easy to make too much of a fuss about the arts. But because you can have those kind of transcendent experiences, I've not had very many in my life, either in meditation or out of it. But I've had, a, I, I, off the top of my head, two or three or four or five even, exper aesthetic experiences that are to do with works of art. Um, once watching an opera by Wagner, um, uh, and, and a good few times in, with painting. And then I just... I became kind of a devotee of Suzanne after that moment, and I couldn't look at him enough. I just kept looking at Suzanne. Every, I remember going to a big exhibition that had one Suzanne in it, and all I looked at was, was the Suzanne. You know. um, he's a painter that doesn't give you very much at first glance, um, but the more you stay with him, the, the, the more there is to give you. Um, I think he will end up being the great painter, you know, um, the great modern painter. Um, yeah, then I've, I've read four biographies of Cezanne, I've read critical studies, I've read the letters in two different translations. You know, it's been a kind of obsession for the last, I don't know, nearly 40 years of my life, you know. And it, it, had it not been, I, I have a wonderful poetry mentor and friend, Mimi Calvati, a wonderful poet. And it was only because of a mistake when I was preparing poems to show her in the Crumb Road, the, the, the collection appeared. I was, I was sending poems off to her to look at. And uh, 
I had too many as always. I, I used to be very prolific. I'm, I'm getting less prolific now, I'm pleased to say. But I used to write them an awful lot, far too much. And um, I, I had one tiny poem, one of those poems about Suzanne in the Crumb Road. I think it's only two verses long. And it was very slight, and I thought, shall I send it to her or throw it away? And I thought, oh, I'll just send it to her, you know, see what she thinks. And we looked at all the poems, and then at the end she said, um, and what about this one? this poem on the Suzanne, because a lot of the poems then were about my wretched childhood and so on. Um, what about this poem on Suzanne? You know, I'd not seen anything like this before. Tell me more about Suzanne. So I burbled on about my love of Suzanne. And she just said, you should write a collection on Suzanne. <gasps> and had she not said that, I would, never have I would never have had the temerity to write a collection on a major painter like Suzanne. People, if they write collections on painters, tend to choose more obscure painters or modern painters or uh, so forth, to write a collection on, you know, a, a, a painter of Cezanne's stature is, you know, outrageous thing to do. But it was, you know, her encouragement, really. Wow. Well, what an answer. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> uh, I have one more question before we plunge into the poems. You've used a quote as a frontispiece. Uh, a quote by Cezanne, uh, Cezanne to Emile Barnard, Bernard, 26th of May, 1904, talking about art is virtually useless. Mm. And I'd be interested to know why you chose that quote at the beginning of a poetry uh, book about Cezanne, which is basically talking about art, I guess. Yes, that's right. I mean, partly it's a warning to myself. You know, to... I, to, in, a, in another translation, it's talking about art is almost useless, but it's a, pretty much the same. Um, Suzanne's letters are wonderful in their own right. I mean, they're, they're up there with Keats's letters and other people's you know, great letters, particularly the late letters to his son. Um, um, yeah, so partly it was a warning about to myself, you know, per, talking about art is virtually useless. Also, it is very easy to talk about art, and... I've, I've often experienced talking about art as not helping you get closer to it. Um, it's easy to be clever about art um, uh, in, in, a way, in a sort of point-missing way, especially in this sort of disavowal of beauty that you're, you're still sort of seeing more and more of, I think. Um, but also, I, I think it, for me, it's really striking going back to the paintings, looking at the paintings, Suzanne's paintings again. And I haven't scratched the surface of those paintings in these poems. Um, like, I can't believe that there, was, there were so many more notes for them. And, you know, when you're writing something, you, you start with great ambitions and you shrink and shrink and shrink until you find something you can actually say. You know, most of it's just discarded. Most of writing is really deleting writing. Um, so I was really struck by that I've, I've not got anywhere near the paintings. And I, there's nothing... You know, there, there are wonderful biographies of Suzanne. De Alex Danchez, the most recent biography, I interviewed him, the poetry is, is the best, I think, and his new translation of the poem, of the letters, is, is, is wonderful. And they can really, they can get you enthusiastic about Suzanne, but nothing, nothing replaces the moment of standing in front of the painting. You have to go there and stand there. You have to do that. Knowing about his life, knowing about his, his significance to other painters, I don't know, can help or not. When I had that experience with Suzanne, I knew next to nothing about him and didn't know his I heard of his significance, but I didn't really understand it. I wasn't that interested. So nothing takes the place of standing in front of a, a painting and meeting it with everything you've got. You're trying to meet everything the painter has got with everything you've got. It, it's too easy to sort of want the painter to do all the work for you. You have to go and meet him. You have to give him what, or her, what you've got. You have to be open to them. I remember a while ago um, going to see some work, art, sculptures by, um, I can't remember her name now, uh, uh, it's gone my, okay, anyway, going to see some sculptures with some friends of mine who they were all, all been to university, they're all much better educated than me, um, and, and they just wouldn't try. I was really struck by it. That they, you know, they'd all been to good universities, they were all terribly uh, educated. But when it came to uh, looking at Henry Moore or uh, uh, Elizabeth Frink or uh, um, uh, whoever, they just wouldn't try to be open. They wouldn't open up to it. They wouldn't risk it. 
And I, I thought they were sort of, frankly, I thought they were, an igno they were being an ignoramus. Being an ignoramus has nothing to do with education. It's to do with whether you're willing to open up to a work of art. And nothing replaces that moment. At, at best, reading about art or talking about art can get you interested in that moment. But nothing uh, replaces that moment. Mm. Well, fascinating. Uh, I can ask a few questions about what you've just said, Maja Bandhu, but if I do, I, I, I fear that there won't be any time for you to read some of the poems, and I really want readers and listeners to hear some of those poems. Um, so we, let's plunge in, and which one have you decided to begin with? Well, I thought I'd read this poem. Um, it's called The Apple's Progress, um, which is an ode. I think it's my first, well, it's my first ode. Um, odes are often written to something, aren't they? Ode to a Grecian urn, uh, ode to a nightingale. They're used, of, often praise poems, um, and they're often trying to say some big thing. Not, not many people write odes anymore, because in modern writing poetry, it's very, very difficult to say something big. It looks cheap now. Um, w. H. Auden, the English poet, said when people... When, when, when a poet tries to raise his voice or her voice, they sound false. Um, so it's quite difficult to write odes now. The great odes really are lit, written by Larkin now. But anyway, this was my I, attempt at an ode. And it's called The Apple's Progress. The rosy apple passed down by the snake with a putto's chubby face and toddler hands to be taken by an already e reaching Eve, restrained, at least dissuaded, by beefy Adam in Rubens' copy of Titian's original, inspired by Raphael's fresco and Duro's print, appears 150 years later in Le Buffet, another still life by Cezanne. This orange, if it is an orange, finding its necessary weight, this lemon turned towards the orange, which is so empathically full-faced, this propped-up apple, almost erotic in curvaceousness and stem-end, this distance, intimate, standoffish, between the apple and a second lemon, this fellowship of fruit, these colours conversing together, and apart. The tablescape maintains a swaying balance between illuminated and shaded, colour begetting colour, its gaucheries at home in evident design. Neither artful nor showy, a few estimated and cherished things join hands across a space with sensual fruit and sugary biscuits. Each teacup an actor object beset by touches, beguiled by troubled shape. It might be summer's marriage hymn, a bottle taciturn in brown, a chalice beaker, blue and bling, a cloth and walnut dresser, each stubborn thing relieved of contradiction by assiduity of thought. Love is a candle, lighting many candles without surcease. It is this apple next to this lemon, next to this other lemon, in a still life by Cezanne. That was an interesting experience for me, Maya Chobandu, because I've read the poem and looked at the picture, uh, the painting, many times since I bought the book. And sometimes I read the poem, and then I look over at the picture, but it's both to do with sight. Mm. But what was happening there was I was hearing the poem, so I didn't have to look at the poem. Mm. I was looking at the painting, and it was very, very different. Ah, uh, ah. It was, yeah, it was, a, it was a real whole kind of experience. Ah, ah, really wonderful. Yeah. Um, I have a couple of questions, if you don't mind, about mm, yeah, the poem. Yeah, of course, go for it, yeah. Um, first of all, there seems to be some humour in the poem. Yes, I'm glad yes. you noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as I was reading it last night, I, uh, 
I, I began to smile. I'm not sure that I'd, I'd really noticed it before. Um, this lemon turned towards the orange, which is so emphatically, in, emphatically full face. Mm -hmm. This propped-up apple, almost erotic in curvaceousness and stem end. This distance, intimate, standoffish between the apple and the second lemon. Mm -hmm. I, I find that so so lovely to think. It, and then you you call them this fellowship of fruit, mm -hmm. uh, the four pieces of fruit there. Mm -hmm. But the, the 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 really laugh out loud bit comes a bit later, with. Um, <laughs> it might be a summer's marriage hymn, a bottle. Mm -hmm taciturn in brown, a chalice beaker, blue and bling. Yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I was worried I about it, that think, word. Yeah, but... absolutely correct. That is rather bling, isn't it, that chalice? It is rather bling, yeah. Yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Lovely have also got painting, Beastie Adam poem. there earlier on, which is a, you know, it's a, it is slightly comic. It's, yes. It doesn't want to take itself too seriously, you know. Yes, yeah. Do you think that the painting is itself slightly comic, or is that just your take on it? Oh, I don't know. I never thought... I think... Well, I think... I think of the comic as being um, the human. Uh, I, I, I'd like to write more comic work. Um, I think it's a very human... Th I, I remember reading Penelope Fitzgerald, a wonderful novelist, and she said, our lives are too uh, painful... are, are too... Our lives are too small to be tragic and too painful to be comic. So that her vision was that life is itself is sort of tragic comic, that you try and make it tragic, and it's uh, that, that our lives aren't big enough for that. They, you know, we're not hero, heroes in a Greek myth, yes. but they're too serious to be comic. So I really love that sort of tragic comedy. I'd like I'd like to write like that more um, if I could. You know. Um, but you sort of, I, I, did, I remember worrying about bling, you know, I thought, really, kind of poem, which, because I've also then, you know, two lines later got the word assiduity, which is, you know, very expensive um, from, the, from a Latinate, uh, you know, and surcease. So it's quite unusual in the same verse to have bling, assiduity, and surcease, you know, yes. mixing high and low diction and all that kind of yes. stuff. Yes, that, that got past your poetry mentor, did it? Yes, that got, <laughs> yes, that got past <laughs> me, yeah. That's good. But then after assiduity of thought comes what seems to me to be a really, really serious point. Yeah. Uh, love is a candle lighting many candles without surcease. Now, I don't know where that comes from because there is no candle in the no. poem. No, um, right. But never mind that. Maybe you've got something to say about that. But then, then you say it, love, that is, it is this apple next to this lemon, next to this other lemon, in a still life by Cezanne. So yes. you seem to be saying that the poem is about love in some way. Yes, and that's my experience of... Painters don't paint things because they, they're, you know, they're trying to change the course of painting. Well, they do, partly. But you paint because you love things, um, because you love the visual world. And I, I think of Cezanne as a lover in that sense. Um, that what he does with fruit, these fruit on a... I mean, he couldn't... You, you know, you see what people think... People think imagination. They want imagination written all over it, you know. It's got to look imaginative. It's got to be a painting of a, a you know, a Dalek and a, a palm tree and a, you know, and a zebra. And, you know, because that, that sounds imaginative. All that... Cezanne does more with a few, you know, a few apples on a tablecloth than most painters can do with any kind of rhetoric and filmmakers and so on. So uh, imagination is to do with this vital response to the, the scene. And he, I, I think he loves the work. I think, you know, he looked at the, those, those, he used to prop them up with a coin. To, he used to spend ages getting it right. Like those teacups, everything would have been moved around endlessly. People used to say it was agonizing seeing him set, set up a still life, never mind paint them. Um, sometimes it's interesting, he used to use plastic fruit because he spent so long it's a bit of a scandal, you know, and wax fruit, because it spends so long painting them that they'd rot, and it would send him into a rage. Um, so, but when you read his letters, when you look at the paintings, what I experience is love. Uh, a, a kind of tremendous love of the, of, of, of the seen world. And when you paint, you know, I remember that painting, 
what you experience as you look is that the world around you is unfathomable. Absolutely. The more you look, the less you know what you're looking at. I, I, you know, I used to then try to paint like Suzanne, of course, which, you know, is impossible. But the more you actually look at a mountain or a tree or a, an apple, the more you, it's just unfathomable. You can't, it's got no edges. It, you know, you, 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 it's unfathomable. You have to recreate it in paint. But you, you end up with love if you look deeply enough. Um, and I think that's what you get from the paintings if you attend to them, you know, well, you know. I mean, also, it's funny how where things come in in poems. One of the things that was happening at the time, I have got girl, little girls, two girls in my life, uh, beautiful girls and my partner's uh, daughters. And I, it was, a, you know, having children in my life changed, has, has changed my view of the world quite a lot. And um, at one, around this time, one of the girls was saying, who do I love most? Do I love Rhea most or Alex most? And um, I was saying, well, I was trying to explain that love isn't like that. It's not something that is like a cake, that if someone has a bigger slice than you, that it's, it's a bit more like a candle. And anyway, it found its way into the poem. Originally, they were actually mentioned in the poem, but they had to be cut out. OK. Let's move on to another poem. What's your second choice? Well, you know, I'm a great lover of the still life, so I, I choose this, this poem called The Black Clock. It's interesting you, you chose that one, Maitre Bandu, because, um, because it's, uh, it's not a pretty painting for me. It's not, it doesn't attract me. So no. then, when you chose that one, I thought, oh, that's an interesting one to choose. Why choose that one? Yes, yes. Yes, I don't really. It, it's, 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 it's an inter partly because it's an interesting painting. It's, you, you, in this painting, you catch Cezanne midway between his early work, his Manier Criard, however you pronounce it, um, which is translated as ballsy uh, work, um, and his great achievement that you've just seen in that painting before. Um, he, when, when he started set painting, Cezanne's paintings were pretty awful. They're very melodramatic. They're very um, airless and kind of overworked. Um, you would never believe he'd turn out to be the great painter that he did. I mean, people used to say, you, you, this is obviously not the thing for you, you know. Um, and this painting is a, a very important painting historically because You've got a bit of those early melodrama in the blacks of the painting, which he soon doesn't use black at all, hardly, or uses it in with the most exquisite refinement. And you've got the beginnings of this incredibly disciplined refinement that he discovered, which was a kind of, I think, a kind of hammering out of his rage, you know, into something like the proper argument. It was, it's almost, Cezanne's work is almost like a great essayist, where you start with just being horrible about things because you get such a so enraged about things and then you push your argument to be more and more beautiful and more and more deep and more and more persuasive and more and more accurate and less and less prejudiced that's that's what you've got in his work i think anyway let's try this one the black clock is a little bit longer um it's a sort okay. of road as well actually i think so the black clock the first tablecloth, as far as I remember, or the first to play an active part, was in the black clock. The painting Zola hung in his cluttered dining room. Suzanne was cadging money and trying to hide the truth about Hortense and little Paul from Louis Auguste. It's beginning to take on the air of a vaudeville farce. The painting is halfway between his ballsy style, his manière cuillard, and his great maturity. So the blacks, the decorative band of the coffee cup, the clock itself, are still foreboding. Picasso stole the lemon, dead centre, although the yellow is surely Brock's, a dun yellow, saddened by northern grey. The conch shell, balanced on the edge, is a studio prop, never to be reused, although its lip and coil are mimicked by a ruck in the tablecloth the lemon hides behind. When you step back, you realise just how much space the cloth takes up. You've been envying the vase, little drama of the cup and saucer, Chardon-like, teetering on the brink, taking you forward 
to so many tablecloths with a water jug, wine bottle, or plate of sugary biscuits resting on them. But also, now you look again, taking you back to your own life and your mother laying out a cloth for funerals and christenings with crisps and pickled onions, sandwiches and Coke. So doesn't it make you wonder if those tablecloths ruffled over a table or interrupting a wall, weight white, greyed by shadow or pinked by ripening fruit, if those tablecloths do the work of benediction, fair linen to be rolled, not folded, chalice veil and coverlet, the winding sheet of Jesus where he lay. And don't you think, as you turn to join the daily crush, that the world is not to be learned and thrown aside like casual litter, but reverted to and relearned in a lemon, a fluted vase, weighing our inwardness against this outness in a seashell's carnal mouth, a clock without its hands. Mm. In the interview you did uh, a couple of days ago about your poetry as a whole, uh, you were discussing with Jana Vacha the, the, um, the autobiographical coming in to poems about the present. Mm. And uh, that obviously comes in here, doesn't it? Mm. Uh, now you look again, taking you back to your own life and your mother laying out a cloth for funerals and christenings with crisps and pickled onions, sandwiches and coke. Mm. <laughs> they got past your, those words got past your, <laughs> yes. your poetry <laughs> mentor as well, yes. <laughs> yeah, well, it's funny, isn't it? Because that creates another still life when you read it. Um, that, that's the still life I was used to, not lemons. That are, I was, you know, you remember, the, they were, I, it was much longer, that list. You know, remember the, you know, in, the, in a beer glass. What did you have? Um, celery in a beer glass and, you know, um, and pineapple on sticks and all that kind of stuff. That's the world that I come from and Coke and, yes. you know, bowls of crisps and peanuts and so on. Yes. You know, not the sort of thing that Cezanne would have painted. But I was obsessed with these tablecloths. You know, I, I'd, I'd written many more poems about the tablecloths, but there's something about the tablecloths in Cezanne which, I don't know, I just can't get to the end of. They're just wonderful. Mm, interesting. And after this little bit of um, kind of reflection on your own life, your own still lives from your past, then you kind of ask a long question, don't you? Mm. So doesn't it make you wonder if those tablecloths, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and, and don't you think, as you turn to join the Daily Crush, that the world is not to be learned and thrown aside like casual litter, but reverted to and relearned in a lemon, et cetera, et cetera? Mm. I, I can only catch a kind of the, end, the, the tail end of the meaning of that. Um, yes. the, lear, the world is not to be learned um, and thrown aside like casual litter. How, how do we do that? What was in your mind? Well, that's the thing about writing poetry. You never quite know what is in your mind. <laughs> but you're always writing poetry with one eye open and one eye closed, um, it seems to me. Um, I think what I must have had in mind was that this terrible nature of knowing things um, we think we know each other, we think you look at an apple, you don't look at an apple, you just see apple. You, you know, you don't look at a tree, you see a child's lollipop drawing of a tree. You don't see a face, you just see a smiley face, you know. The world is destroyed by our familiarity with it. We, we learn it so deeply that I, I glance up from this and see a chair, and I don't look at the chair, I just, this chair. I don't partake in it. It doesn't have a spirit. Um, and we destroy, we, in, inevitably, you know, children don't have it. I remember, I remember lifting Alex up into this tree, a chestnut tree that was ill, and, you know, saying, oh, they've got this, they've got this infection and all the chestnut trees are ill. And when we went, she said, bye-bye, tree, I hope you get better soon. You know, um, and we have to learn that away, don't we? That we don't say, bye-bye, tree, hope you get better soon. But one of the, Surely one of the meanings of 
life as, as you get older is to try to relearn something of that attitude of reverence and wonder and, and that the tree is alive and conscious in, its, in some mysterious way from its own side. Um, it's not just to be learned and thrown away like casual litter with the word chestnut tree or the word father or the word um, tr- uh, in mountain. Hmm. What Cezanne does is constantly look again, um, breaks out of what, because what he does in his paintings is he, he doesn't paint a tree or an apple. He used to say, look, I, I, you know, I paint that red next to that half red next to that blue green. He, he said that all you can see is oscillating transitions of color. Um, and he tried to be truthful to that. Not, not that's a tree, isn't it? And that's the shadow of a tree. No, that's that green, and then next to that is that green, and then next to that is blue, except for we'd want to call it sky. He's, he's just trying to say, no, what you see is this shifting, oscillating transitions of colour. And I think that's, that what, that's something about what I meant by relearning um, to see and test this inwardness. Because he said, he talk, talked about his paintings as his experiments. He didn't talk about painting, he said, I'm at work at my experiments. I am making some progress. Why, is, why so late and with so much difficulty? He's trying to get back to um, seeing, you know, it, it, it's very Buddhist, I think, in many ways. He's trying to, uh, in the scene, only the scene. He's just trying to say, what am I actually experiencing? And what am I overlaying with dead language? Yeah? Uh, I think that's what I was getting at, something like that. Mm, fascinating. Fascinating. Maitre Abanda, we have to draw to a close soon. Yes, I bet, yes. Two I would like oh. another poem, though. Let's try and another. I wonder if I could make uh, a request. Oh, yeah, do. I like that. The poem and the painting that when I first read the book that really had the biggest effect on me was the painting of a mountain. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. I think it works beautifully as a poem about the, the painting. So mm. would you mind if we finish with that one? Yes, of course. Um, I can't remember which number that was. This painting of a mountain. Yes. Yes, this is my, the poem most um, influenced by the poetry of Wallace Stevens. Wallace Stevens is a, another kind of god to me. Um, interestingly, Cezanne was a god to Wallace Stevens. Um, he said, when I die, there'll be written on my heart the words aix en provence um, uh, he wrote a, a long poem called The Man with the Blue Guitar, um, oh, a wonderful fun. poem in, in couplets. Uh, and I, I was you know, besotted by this poem and wanted to write a similar one, you know, a great length. I think it was originally 92 lines long. Anyway, Mimi said, I think you've just about done it after the second section. So it just cut, took me forever and just cut all the rest out. And, and she was right, as, as usual. And of course, it's in two sections, but... It's only two sentences. So two sections and in, in, in two section sentences. Yes. Um, this painting of a mountain. This painting of a mountain and a lane, a thirsty spruce blowing up a curve, the mountain falling on its knees, the sky above a yellow earth made morning cool, made evening warm, a lane that winds below a house in summer's painted wind, a wind that stops in green and greener trees. All this, a sensual sky and summer not yet done, is not to say adieu to yellow roads and gusty trees, this hulking up beyond, but just the longest doting way to say bonjour, bonjour, to summer's massive house. To say bonjour to summer's massive house, to call it red and yellow, blue for shade, to name this blueness as the breadth of sky, this yellow but the dustiness of lanes, a tree that shakes itself in summer wind, a wind that blows us mortal out and in, to know we pass our days in summer's house, our home below the beaten sky of gold that Moses saw above Mount Horeb's height, is just my doting way to say, Suzanne has seen it better, the sacred and profane, in this painting of a mountain and a lane. Yes, 
beautiful poem, beautiful painting. The words See how the painting, the painting, the poem was trying to do what painters do, which is go over the same thing again and again. Ah. So it starts off this painting of a mountain and a lane and finishes. You know, you, paintings don't go from left to right like writing. They yes. go over, over. And I created this very complex form that it went over itself again and again for 92 lines. But we didn't. That, that was rubbish. But, um, you know, bonjour, bonjour to someone's massive house. To say bonjour to someone's massive house. Yes. They're all going over the same kind of areas of the canvas, if you see what I mean. Do you know, I hadn't noticed that the first line and the last line were, were, were more or less the same. I just they're more or less the same, the echoes, the conscious <laughs> echoes. Thank you for that. <laughs> and the last line of the first section and the first line of the second section are yes. the same echoes. So they're, it's like going over the same area of a canvas again and again. That was the yeah. idea. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. So when I first read the poem, and I looked at the painting. I thought the summer house you were mentioning was the little house at the bottom yes. of a mountain, which mm. indeed is yellow. Um, what colours do you, do you say? I can't remember now. Mm. Oh, yellow, blue. Uh, call it red, yellow, blue for shade, because it is mm. rather red and yellow with blue for shade. Mm. But then you call it summer's massive house. And mm. I began to wonder whether you meant something other than the little house in the painting. Yeah, so it was, it was stimulated by the house in the painting. I mean, this is, and this again, so often with poems and so often with the imagination generally, it comes in at the side. It's nearly always a mistake or a happenstance or a, I didn't mean to. It was just that somebody sent me a postcard with that painting, painting on it and I put it in, on my desk. And one morning I just thought, I looked at it again and even in the postcard I thought, that is incredible. You know, I, I, there's something I need to say about that. But it had that, friend of mine not sent me that po postcard, it would never have been written. It's, you know, it's just a happenstance. Um, and yes, it originally was that, the, the house in the, in the painting, but I don't know, there's something about, I, w I was trying to reach for, I think, it, it, you know, because I got Stephen, Wallace Stevens very much in my mind. He, he's, he's, he's a poet of the grand statement, you know, God and the imagination are one, is one of his famous grand statements in a poem. You know, nobody could get away with that. Uh, it's only because he uses such gorgeous language, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, I can't remember any, you know, there's so much of it, but I'd love to write in that, you know, you know, very, very grand fashion. Um, and Summer's Massive House seemed to me to be an image for life itself. Um, you know, I also, I was, I, I was about to go to Aix-en-Provence and um, Suzanne so often writes about summer and the, how, how scorchingly hot it was in, in, in the south of France. But somehow, it wants to be an image, I think, for Summer's Massive House of the life that we live in. You know, that we're in Summer's Massive House. And also, I think I'm wanting to say that we've got every reason to celebrate, um, every reason to say yes to life. And any, any work of art is, even if it's a work of art about a suicide, I've just written, read a, a novel by Yi Young Lee, a, a novelist I'm very keen about, and, um, she's written a, a, another, a novel about a suicide, uh, her daughter's suicide. Um, even that is a, is a sort of celebration of life. Otherwise, you just wouldn't do it. Um, there, there, there's an, life has got endless beauty in it. It's also got endless horror and ugliness. Um, and it's very easy to get seduced by the horror and ugliness, and it's very easy to disavow the beauty. Um, but that life wants us to appreciate it. And I think that's what painting particularly comes from. Um, and certainly Cezanne is, is the core, you know, the, so th these are all painted, you know, this, this, this mountain, um, Mont Saint-Victoire, he painted, I can't remember, 36 times or something like that. Um, he painted it again and again. And it, it's a mountain that he was, grew up next to. It's not, um, you know, it's not a tourist mountain he went down to see. It's not, you know, it's just... It's like me painting the mount in Henley and Arden. It's just what he'd lived with all his life. He, grew, he, he played on it as a boy, you know. Um, mm. He got drunk coming down there from, with friends when he was a young man, you know. It's, okay. a, it's a mountain he's loved and lived with all of his life, and, you know. Um, and he wants to keep on appreciating it. And, golly, doesn't that see, you know, and, you know the man was, he had terrible, his health was not very good by then. He, he died literally... He said, he said I, I'm old and ill and I will die painting. 
And he literally did. He, he died walking back from painting Mont Saint Victoire. Um, you know, because mainly because he wouldn't pay for the a taxi. Basically, the, the taxi driver, the coach driver, put the, ta- the, the, the the fare up to five francs, and he he thought he was being ripped off. So he insisted on walking or nine miles. You know, he often would walk those kind of distances, and he had diabetes. You know, had all sorts of health problems. Mm. Um, but he's wanting to say, there's endless beauty, and I've got to get some of it down. I, I think that's a deep motivation for Zan. That's what I get from him, is that there's, so, there's too much... Be- I can only get a tiny amount of it down on this bit of canvas or this bit of paper, but there's so, that you want to worship it. You want to get as much down as you can. And Cezanne got more beauty down on canvas with an apple or a mountain or a painting of his wife than uh, you know, many of us will ever do. You know. mm, mm. And... Uh... You use the word doting twice. Yes, yeah, this doting yeah. way. Yes. So, uh, the, the second one is right at the end of the poem, you say, um, it's just my doting way to say Cezanne has seen it better. Mm. The sacred and profane in this mountain of a mountain and a lane. Mm. I think it is sacred, you know, because I, I don't believe in the, that distinction. I don't think Buddhism believes in that distinction between sacred and profane. You know, uh, one of the great dangers to modern Buddhism is secularism, um, and people can think that Buddhism is a kind of kind of secular. Um, I think anyone who's if, if Cezanne would know, he used to go to church. He didn't believe in it, but he used to go because he he liked being there. You know, he I think he's touched by the sacred as well as by the profane, and because of his looking. And in a way, it's interesting that you've chosen this poem because it that, that's in a way it says why I wrote the collection. It's just my doting way to say Suzanne has seen it better, the sacred and profane, in this painting of a mountain and a lane. You know, um, couldn't be simpler, a mountain and a lane. That's all it is, you know. Yes, yeah. Thank you so much, my Chirandu. This has been an amazing hour for me, just so um, uh, informative, but also so beautiful and mind-opening. Just fantastic. Mm. Thank you. Well, thank you very, very much for inviting me. That's really lovely. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I'll probably invite you again at some point. When, so. your, when your new volume comes out. I, yeah, don't I, hold your breath. It's going to be a long time volume. coming, the next one. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a very long poem, I heard. It's a book-length poem, yeah. It's a yes. book-length poem, and it's spoken to Bante, weirdly. To Sangharachita, your teacher. To Sangharachita, yeah. So the you, the, any time I say you in the poem, a book-length poem, I mean... Sangrach to Bante, the founder of our movement. Well, I will probably get in touch with you when that comes out and ask you to do another interview. (laughs) Well, that would be delightful. (laughs) Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.